Alright, so we're checking out the Insta360 ONE RS in this video. It's been about two years since the original ONE R came out. And as you can see, it's still modular. Um, pretty much uh, the same. I'll, I'll explain all of the upgraded features and new stuff in this video. Uh, but there's also a lot of stuff that's the same as well. So they sent me the twin edition of this camera. Uh, obviously, it will come out in all the other versions as well. If you just want the 4K version or the 360 version or the one inch version, just like before, those will all be available. Uh, the components uh, that are, are interchangeable here can work with the older components. So uh, they maintain the interchangeability of the parts. And so if you just want to get the new 4K boost mod or the new core, you can use it with the old stuff. Um, I wasn't able to test that because uh, the old core needs a firmware update, which wasn't available at the time of the recording of this video, but uh, they told me that that will get done by the launch date. But basically, what you have here is a new updated core, which is where all the processing happens, and you have a little viewfinder screen on this side, uh, updated firmware and interface, which I'll show you, of course. And then you get a new 4K module. So this has a updated lens and sensor. So the sensor is now a half inch sensor and 48 megapixels for photos, which is uh, significantly more detailed than on the old uh, 4K lens and sensor. So this sensor here is a F2.4 16 millimeter equivalent. So it's a little bit brighter and a little bit more wide angled. Now the upgraded core uh, has a faster processor in here. So it's able to uh, have actually better stabilized in-camera video. So if you're doing the 4K 30, 4K 60 in-camera stabilization, uh, that is now much improved over the old one uh, because the faster processor is able to handle the uh, stabilization better in camera. And the additional faster processor is able to uh, transfer files via Wi-Fi up to about 50% faster than the old version. So another part of this whole new uh, setup here is a larger battery. So this battery is a little bit thicker than the old battery. It's about 1475 milliamp hours, I believe. So this is the new one here already attached. And then this is the old one here. It's about 1170, I believe, milliamp hours. So it's just a little bit thicker than the old battery, but it otherwise works the same. Uh, because it's a little bit thicker, they now have a new cage that's included. And this one's a better design with this quick release latch that pops off like this. And it's easier to uh, get the camera in and out of here. So just pop it in like so, and it locks down. And uh, this has, uh, I guess over here in this part, there's a uh, heat dissipating mechanism for the core so that um, obviously since it's enclosed, it's gonna uh, probably get a little bit hotter, but this front part here is actually better for heat dissipation. Now, since you have a new cage here, this is the one of the things that is not compatible with the old system, so uh, you cannot put the new uh, system in here with the bigger battery into the old cage. That's not going to fit because the battery is bigger. Plus the dimensions of the 4K mod is a little bit different as well, so it does not fit into the old cage. So this being the twin edition, it does come with the 360 mod. The 360 mod is the same as the old version. They haven't changed it at all, so it's the same lenses, same sensor. Uh, basically functions the same way. So I'm not going to be covering uh, the specific details about the 360 mod. Obviously, if you've seen my previous videos on the 1R, uh, I use this in a lot of these uh, 360 drones. And so the, because the uh, image is going to be, the image quality is going to be the same, I'm not going to be showing any additional images in this video. If, uh, I'll link some videos uh, down in the video description if you want to see some sample video from this particular mod. Uh, you'll be able to get some samples from that. Uh, I think those are from some invisible drones. Uh, it basically functions the same. As far as I know, there's no differences. Everything appears to uh, function the same as well. Also at the same time, the one inch mod with the one inch sensor, this one is also the same, has not changed. Um, and the way it functions 
with the new core appears to be the same as well. It's just that the, obviously the new core has a different interface and which I will actually show you now. So the startup sound is a lot more pleasant now than compared to before. So a few things to note about the uh, new interface here. You have this Q and then this plus sign over here. So to activate this is the quick, uh, the, um, quick menu. You swipe over from this corner and to the right. And it'll bring up the quick menu and so you have some predefined preset um, like modes that you can put in here. And if you want to switch to those really quickly, uh, you can put these into the camera and program these to uh, customize them to what you want. So this is a much better system than they had uh, on the old uh, camera. Over here, this plus sign is actually here to access the instant zoom feature and also the different field of view. So you swipe over and you can see we're on ultra wide. So if we tap on that, we can switch the uh, field of view from ultra wide to wide, to linear, to narrow. This is gonna uh, matter more if you're gonna be doing the in-camera stabilization. If you're using the studio app to do stabilization uh, on the computer or on your phone, then the, the field of view is just going to be, I think, uh, defaults to ultra wide, and you can reduce it in uh, post processing. But you can bring this up, and then you get this additional menu here at the bottom where you can scroll left and right, and you can actually you can see I'm zooming in, and it changes the focal length. This is obviously a digital zoom because there's no actual me mechanical zoom in this camera. Um, so, you know, uh, as you zoom in, it does crop in the sensor to do that. And you can do this while you're recording. So if you're recording and all of a sudden you want to zoom in on something and get a little bit more detail, you can do that in camera, of course. Of course, you can always just uh, crop in uh, in post-processing as well. But if you want to do this in camera while you're recording, you can do that. And just it's obviously very, it's very linear here. You don't have to uh, select any of the specific uh, field of views, you can actually just crop in, you know, incrementally here using this feature. So this is one of the new features of the new core. Okay, so to access the other modes, it's a kind of a different system. So basically you swipe to the left and the right. And so you have your basic video mode, active HDR. That's active HDR video is a new video mode in this camera. The old one, they called it HDR video. So this one's a a little bit different, basically active HDR video has uh, more details in the highlights and the shadows compared to just regular video. I think you use that in situations where maybe you're uh, filming directly into the sun, for example, where uh, highlights might get blown out, for example, that might be useful there. But um, I hadn't noticed that huge of a difference in terms, of, I'll, I'll show you some samples here later on. But here's uh, some of the additional modes. So you have time-lapse, time shift, slow motion, loop recording, the 6K widescreen mode is a new mode, it's like a 2.35 to one mode where basically you have the black bars on the top and the bottom. I'll show you an example of that later. You have burst photos, star lapse mode. So it's like uh, basically like nighttime uh, star lapse. Uh, so like, it's like a, basically it's like a time lapse at night. So if you want to see like your stars going across the sky over a large period of time that you can use this mode. You have night photo mode interval shooting mode, HDR photo mode. So HDR photos actually takes uh, a, a two different exposures and combines them into one photo. So basically it captures all the details in the highlights and in the shadows. So if you want to uh, have some really nice photos, you can use that mode. I'll show you some samples of that later. Yeah, regular photo mode, and then back to video. So then within these modes, you can adjust uh, the resolution and the frame rate. So you have two different types of videos you can take. Flow state video, which is the in-camera stabilization mode. So everything here will take advantage of the faster processor that's in the core and stabilize the video in camera and not, you don't have to, you have to export it to your PC or phone and then stabilize it. So for those of you guys that wanted to you know, basically have like instant gratification, record your videos and have it already stabilized and then, um, uh, you know, export it out to like Instagram or Facebook, whatever, without having to do an extra step. This is the mode you want. And then these are obviously the different frame rates available to you, 4K, 24 to 60. You have 1080p to 2.7K. And then within uh, those you have 60 to 24. 
FPS, 1080p, 60, 24 FPS for all of these. So this is all in camera stabilization. If you want to do stabilization on the app, you hit post. And then these are the modes available. So you have 4K 30, 24, 25, and then you have 4K 4.3 mode. So basically uh, that will record a 4.3 video. And um, these are the different frame rates. And then you take that video, put it into Insta um, 360 Studio, the new, newest version 2022. There you can adjust the field of view and also the type of stabilization you want uh, from that video. Now what's interesting to note here between 4K 16.9 and 4K 30 is that if you select 4K 16.9 post, it does actually record the video in 4.3 uh, in a 4.3 container, but it puts the metadata into the file so that when you import it into Insta360 Studio, it actually converts it into a 16.9 format. And then, uh, so for example, for those of you guys that are uh, exporting these videos for FPV use, I would recommend um, you recording in this mode. Uh, post-processing 4K 16.9 and then when you bring it in uh, select the FPV field of view mode that will give you probably the closest thing to super view in terms of its, its equivalent on the GoPro so it maintains that uh, full vertical field of view um, but it stretches out the left and the right sides of the image like super view does it's a little bit different so not quite the same I'm going to cover that in uh, my next video on comparing this to um, a GoPro Hero 10. So if you're looking for specific details in that, it's not gonna be in this video. I'm gonna cover that in more spe specific detail in the next one. Okay, so to bring up your like previous videos, you can swipe from the bottom and you can look at uh, stuff that's already recorded on the device. If you wanna look at your settings, swipe from the top. And then these are your different settings. You can go into here for your different menus. If you swipe over from the left, this brings up the different modes. Swipe left and right on, on the actual, either from the left or in the center of the screen. If you swipe over from the right, that'll actually bring up manual, uh, manual video modes. There we go. So you can have, right now I think you can see it's on auto. Um, different color profiles, so Vivid is uh, pretty much everything that I've recorded in this video is on Vivid. There's standard, which is um, basically the, the colors are not quite as saturated. And then you have log mode, which is basically a flat color profile. If you want, For those of you guys that want to do your own color, uh, color grading, you, know, you would record in that mode. But uh, for the sake of this video, everything is recorded in Vivid mode. So this is, a, this is all auto here. You can, uh, you can see you know, what the different settings are currently. But you can adjust everything to manual, and then, and then you can actually adjust your frame rates and, uh, I'm sorry, your uh, shutter speed here. You can adjust your ISO. So you can adjust all that manually. And also your white balance. So if you want to have a fixed white balance, like in some, some certain situations, you know, those will be appropriate. So for those of you guys that like to mess around with your manual settings, this is how you would get into there. But for all the samples in this video, everything has been recorded in auto mode. Okay, so a quick note on the waterproof rating on this camera. It is rated to 16 feet. Um, if you have the camera, all the components put together properly and inside the cage, and this cage actually holds everything together, because there are the small like uh, rubber gaskets here around obviously things that are need to be electrically uh, sealed and away from water like the battery for example so uh, one of the things that you need to check here is that there's no sand or dirt on the seal so that uh, it actually uh, keeps the water out if there's like dust or sand or something in here which typically sometimes happens, then uh, that'll obviously allow water in, which is bad, and then uh, the camera will obviously die. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's rubber seals there, and then in between the mods, there's uh, rubber seals here uh, for these parts as well, and you wanna check these. You can see I've got already some dust here on the sides. So something to note, 
Um, if if you want it, if you want to maintain the waterproof uh, rating of the camera, you do need to keep it relatively clean so that the seals do their job and uh, protect the camera, the electrical components from the water to keep it waterproof up to 16 feet. And you do have to use the cage. Okay, so I'm testing the audio out here on the camera. Uh, this camera's got one extra mic compared to the 1R. So uh, they're advertising better audio. Let's see how good this is. I have it on a selfie stick about uh, three feet away. So trying to keep the video in focus. I think if I get closer, then uh, my face will get blurry. And I'm not sure how good the audio will sound further away. Uh, there's some you know, people hurt the park. There's some uh, road noise over here from the street, from the cars on my left, and then uh, out behind me. Let me uh, put the camera a little bit further away here. I'm still speaking in a pretty normal tone of voice. The audio mode on this is set to directional enhancement, so I'm assuming it's probably going to give priority to wherever the sound's coming from and uh, enhance that audio. There's a little bit of wind right now, so I'm not sure how uh, much of the wind's going to be coming through. I'm going to turn on the uh, wind reduction mode at this point. Okay, so I turned on the uh, wind reduction mode. And uh, yeah, it's getting a little bit windy now. Again, uh, road noise is off in that direction behind the camera. Um, I'm going to turn around here. Road noise is now behind me but actually right now there's not a lot of uh, cars uh, as there was a moment ago but um, yeah how does that audio sound uh, yeah, again one additional mic so supposedly the audio will be better on this camera versus the old 1R so here's a comparison of uh, the half inch sensor on the 1RS versus the smaller sensor on the 1R in some low light conditions. Basically the larger sensor gives you a clearer image, a more detailed looking image. The smaller sensor on the older 1R, uh, this image looks a bit softer, maybe a little bit out of focus looks like, but I think that's mainly because the camera is trying to compensate for the low exposure with um, a higher ISO gain and it just kind of gives you a little bit more grainy and sort of a fuzzier image compared to the 1R or compared to the 1RS. So here's a comparison of the normal video mode versus the active HDR video. And here with the sun behind me, you can see that the uh, basically my face doesn't look as dark using the active HDR video. Basically, it looks like it has a wider dynamic range compared to normal video. Okay, so I got the 1RS on uh, this pretty cool RC car that they sent along. And so we'll see how the uh, stabilization does. Uh, you know, obviously, on this kind of surface it's going to be bouncing around a lot so we'll have a pretty good idea how the new flow state stabilization works in camera. Okay, so for those of you guys that are flying FPV drones, I recommend that you record your files um, in the post-processing mode, not the flow state mode, so that it does not do the stabilization in camera. Uh, you'll it, It'll actually look better if you use the studio app and do the um, stabilization in post-processing. So I have the uh, studio uh, app open here on my desktop, and when you open the file, it will look like a 16 by nine uh, video file, but it's actually recorded in camera 
in, as a four by three aspect ratio file. So here's the same file. So it's actually a different part of the clip, but as you can see here, it is a four by three aspect ratio video because the sensor is four by three like it was previously in the one R. And it actually does some de-squeezing and distortion correction uh, while it does the stabilization in the studio app. And I'm gonna show you a few different um, options that it does and what the difference is and what it kind of looks like. So I just wanted to point out that it does record it in 4.3. So you get the full sensor, but it's unstabilized um, video in camera when you use the uh, post-processing mode. And then in the app here, I see it's, it's, it's a 16 by nine image. And I'll just, uh, just play a little bit here. This is the FPV uh, field of view mode. So let me uh, pause it. And if you go over here on the right, you can see stabilization type. You want to click flow state stabilization. If you don't want to stabilize, you can turn it off, of course, and just it'll just do the um, stretching of the image. I'll just convert it from 4.3 to 16 by 9. But of course, you will get all of the jitters. So recommend turning that on. And of course, it does crop in a little bit, of course, when it does the stabilization. And then down here under media processing, you have your different field of view options. Okay, so yeah, I, did, um, yeah, I defaulted to ultra wide. So this is the ultra wide um, field of view. So it takes that four by three and it basically kind of chops off the top and the bottom while it sort of squeezes in on the center for the stabilization. That's pretty normal. Um, it's not quite super view. If you guys are looking for that you know, in terms of a GoPro equivalent, probably the closest thing to that is the FPV field of view, where it it it, tr it tries to maintain most of the right and the left and stretch stretches that out a little bit, but it does chop off the top and the bottom a little bit more. So if you look at action view, you can see here a little bit more of the top and the bottom, but a little bit less of the right and the left in action view. And the center, you know, each one of these, the center has a little bit of a uh, different kind of distortion. So you can see it's a little bit bigger here in the middle. And then in FPV view, it looks like it's a little further away. So uh, in action view, while it looks like it has more of the frame, the center looks like it's more zoomed in. Whereas FPV, it looks um, a little bit more natural looking in the center, um, but a little bit more zoomed in in terms of the vertical field of view. So you get different looks based on which one you choose. If you choose ultra wide, the center is pretty much uh, kind of zoomed in as you can see here with the tree and the goalpost. So uh, you can kind of play with this and see which one you like. Of course, you know, then there's like wide, linear, narrow. And of course these are much more zoomed in. Of course, uh, I don't tend to use any of these because it kind of crops in the video a little bit too much. If you want to have like 360 horizon lock or a 45 degree horizon lock, that'll um, basically give you a different look in terms of how much of the horizon uh, is tilting. So let's just play a little bit of this here. This is what I prefer, the FPV view. It's not quite super view, but it looks the most um, natural looking to me at least. But then if you want to go to like say 45 degree horizon lock, it's going to zoom in quite a bit here, but it's going to try and maintain the horizon so it doesn't get um doesn't tilt as much so you get a much more zoomed in look if you're this is probably not for this kind of freestyle type of video that i'm flying here but more for if you're using this on a cinema then maybe this 45 degree horizon like is something you're going to be wanting to uh, utilize now i'm going to have uh, more fpv footage in a, a later video down the road because uh, they don't have the ND filters ready yet for this camera, so uh, I can't. I, I shot all this in basically auto mode uh, with like the vivid color profile, no color grading. This is all straight out of the camera. So, not really. I mean, in terms of like ease of use, like if you just want quick video, of course, uh, this is uh, probably you know, the easiest way. You just get it out of there, and then you don't have to do any sort of fancy editing or processing, and you'll just have some pretty nice video. Uh, but if you're for those of you guys that want a little more professional looking video out of this camera, uh, you know, you're definitely going to want to get some ND filters and turn on your manual settings and, you know, lock in your ISO, your white balance, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to have a separate video on that later when those ND filters are sent to me. 
so that we can kind of see, um, you know, more of what the potential of this camera is in terms of, you know, a GoPro type of replacement, because right now without that is, you know, uh, it's really hard to compare to the GoPro. And of course that's also going to be another video later because that's all going to be probably another 30 minute video, uh, comparing this camera to the GoPro. So I'm, not really, I'm pretty sure this video is already about 30 minutes. So I'm going to cut this section off here. You know, this is sort of give you a sort of a preview of what it's like on an FPV drone. But, uh, of course it's going to, this is a pretty big topic. So I'll have future videos on this one down the road. Okay, so a quick note on the 48 megapixel photos that are coming out of the sensor. I'm not much of an expert when it comes to photos on action cameras. I actually almost never use the feature. But the photos that the camera produces are very sharp, um, very detailed. And, and because they're um, a resolution of 8,000 by 6,000 pixels on a 4K timeline, you can obviously zoom in very close and see more details on these photos. And one of the things you'll notice here is that the minimum focus distance of this camera is probably like three to four feet. I'm a little bit too close for these flowers and some of these uh, things in the foreground are out of focus versus things in the background are sharper. So something to keep in mind if you're going to be using this for certain kinds of photography, you're going to want to uh, be further away from the object. Okay, so this uh, video is getting pretty long. I'm going to cut it off here. If I've missed anything that you want to see, let me know in the comments below and I'll try and include them in some future videos. Also, I know that you guys are very interested in a side-by-side sort of -side comparison to the GoPro Hero 10 Black. I will do that in a future video, so uh, stay tuned for that. Make sure you're subscribed and have the notification bell turned on so you don't miss that video. That's going to be also a pretty detailed and uh, fairly long video if you want to see a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons of this uh, new 4K sensor versus the GoPro Hero 10 Black. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. I'll talk to you guys in the next one.